The mechanism of action by which cannabis impacts the brain and body, there are going to be a constellation of different accelerations and breaking of different neural systems. Please do understand that there is no way to predict what the effect of a given strain will be on an individual. Let's take a step back into the real world and evaluate or think about what happens when somebody smokes cannabis or ingests cannabis by way of edible or tincture or something of that sort. Cannabis is very fast to enter the bloodstream. In fact, within 30 seconds, it's going to enter the brain and permeate throughout the brain and body. That's very, very fast. I mean, when you contrast that with something like alcohol or even nicotine, depending on how the nicotine is delivered, that is a very fast delivery of the psychoactive and biologically active compound, which in this case is THC and CBD and probably some other things as well. So within 30 seconds, it reaches the brain and bodily tissues. And within 30 to 60 minutes, it's going to reach its peak concentrations and have its peak biological effects. Those aren't always the same thing, but in the case of cannabis, again, here I'm using cannabis as a kind of umbrella term for THC and CBD, the effects are going to peak at about 30 to 60 minutes after bringing those compounds into the body in some way or another. And the effects tend to last anywhere from three to four hours, although there's some variation on that depending on individual metabolism, whether or not somebody is familiar with the compound, believe it or not, psychologically familiar, but also biologically familiar, or whether or not it's a first time use or occasional use and so on. THC and CBD and other components of cannabis are highly what we call lipophilic. That is, they have an affinity toward and they can actually pass through fatty tissues. Now, every cell in your body, but especially neurons, have a double layer of fat on their outside. And of course, when people say hear fat, they always think, ooh, fat's bad, fat's bad. Everyone, you know, most of the world seems to want to lose fat or bodily fat. Here we're talking about the fatty membrane, the barrier around each tissue. And in this case, we're talking particularly about neurons. And THC and CBD and the other components of cannabis are highly lipophilic. So they can get into essentially all cells just simply by flowing into them. They will also remain in those cells for a long time. So I know that a number of people, depending on whether or not they get tested for work or for sport or otherwise for cannabis or CBD and THC, don't take this as a strict number, but typically if one ingests CBD or THC, smokes cannabis, ingests by orally, et cetera, doesn't matter. It's going to stay in that fatty tissue and can be detected for at least as long as 80 days after ingestion. And there's a whole industry as to, you know, how to accelerate the clearance and I should just tell you that just losing bodily fat isn't going to um, eliminate it from your system, maybe partially in those fat cells, but uh, certainly in intravisceral fat and other fatty tissue that's uh, you know, around the brain and body is going to harbor that uh, THC molecule and the CBD molecule for quite a long while, at least 80 days. Okay. So if someone smokes cannabis or they ingest cannabis very rapidly gets into the bloodstream and the components that are psychoactive get into the bloodstream and are immediately able to access neurons and other cells and start having these effects of parking at those endogenous cannabinoid receptors and impacting the signaling between neurons, which leads to the subjective effects of cannabis, including THC and CBD. So let's talk about what those different subjective effects are. Again, this is going to vary depending on whether or not people are ingesting sativa varieties of cannabis. Just to remind you, those tend to be elevated, mood, alertness, talkativeness. People who take sativa varieties tend to talk a lot more than they would otherwise. Again, there are exceptions to this. Of course, there are exceptions. I'm sure there are people out there shouting, although I guess if you're the quiet people who don't talk too much, you're probably not shouting. Or if you're not, you're not doing on sativa, joke intended. But in any event, there are exceptions, but there are also general rules. And the sativas tend to meet people sort of mood elevated, energetic, again, the sort of head high and indica varieties tend to do the opposite, more of a sedative, relaxant, et cetera. Why and how would they do that? Okay, well, without going into an extensive deep dive into the different neurotransmitter systems of the brain and body, what we know for sure is that CB1 receptors are present on an enormous number of different neurons in brain structures and neural circuits so that the sativa varieties that act as sort of a stimulant making people feel happy because in general, they do tend to elevate mood, at least at certain dosages. Talkative tend to make people feel um, like they have ideas that are interesting, that they might want to share, um, tend to narrow their context. So it tend to increase focus. This is something that's not often discussed about cannabis, but it can, especially the sativa varieties can increase people's level of focus to particular things, uh, something they're watching or something they're doing or music allows them to narrow their sense of focus. That's going to occur by activation of CB1 receptors in the so-called prefrontal cortex, which is just behind the forehead. And the prefrontal cortex acts as a strong modulator of so-called limbic circuitry and other circuitry that is more stress-oriented. 
Uh, the way to think about the stress and limbic circuitry, such as the amygdala, which many people have heard about, is that they aren't really circuits for fear and stress. They are circuits that are constantly evaluating one's own internal state, heart rate, etc., and what's happening externally. And sorry to say, but the default of those systems is to detect danger, the sort of threat detection systems. And then the prefrontal cortex largely acts as a break on those systems, sort of like the reins pulling back on a steed of horses that would otherwise just kind of take off. And so the sativa varieties tend to increase CB1 activation in the prefrontal cortex and in other circuitry that then leads to a kind of overall reduction in stress because of the way that prefrontal circuitry can reduce activation of the amygdala. Now that, of course, does not explain why some people become very stressed and very paranoid when they smoke sativa varieties or other varieties of cannabis or ingest other varieties of cannabis. We will talk about the paranoid effect and why that occurs and who might predict that would occur to them in a, in a little bit. But just want to give you a sense of how this is working because as I mentioned before, THC and or CBD are going to bind that CB1 receptor, let's say in prefrontal cortex, a neuron of prefrontal cortex is going to bind there. And then there will be a retrograde signaling back to the presynaptic neuron. And in the case of prefrontal cortex, what's happening is it's increasing transmission, increasing the release of neurotransmitter in prefrontal cortex. However, at the same time, the very same THC and CBD that was brought into the system is binding the very same type of receptors, CB1 receptors in other brain structures, such as the amygdala, and causing retrograde signaling back to the presynaptic neurons in the amygdala, but it's quieting the activation of those neurons. So this is interesting, right? We have the same compounds, THC and or CBD, brought into the body and brain, binding the same receptors, in this case, the CB1 receptors, but depending on where those receptors are located and which brain areas we're referring to, they are either causing heightened levels of alertness and activation of systems that are designed to make you talkative and alertness and mood, et cetera, focus, or they are causing suppression of those circuitries. So we have kind of a seesaw effect here where the same compound is increasing mood and alertness and focus in the prefrontal cortex and is decreasing stress and threat detection in the amygdala. And that's one of the reasons why, especially the sativa varieties of cannabis, allow people to enter these states of focus. Some might even say flow, although I don't want to go into what flow states really are. That's for a different discussion and it's very poorly defined as it is. And I certainly don't want to give people the impression that cannabis increases flow states because that's not always the case. And certainly most often is not going to be the case. But the idea here is that this molecule comes into our brain and is shifting everything towards a state of focus elevated mood of heightened sense of importance about whatever it is that we happen to be doing. And now, of course, whatever we could happen to be doing could be writing a song, writing poetry, communicating with somebody, but it could also be something as trivial as watching cartoons or watching a movie, which is, you know, not trivial in its own right, but in terms of thinking about the creative aspects or the creative activity stimulating aspects of cannabis, productivity oriented. So narrowed focus, elevated mood, more relaxed and yet energetic. That's the major effects of the sativa varieties, except, and this is a really big, bold face, triple underlined, except in some individuals, depending on dosage, but also depending on pre-existing neural circuitry and propensity for anxiety, some people ingest or smoke sativa varieties. And regardless of whether or not it's a type one, type two, or type three variety, Okay, regardless of the ratio between THC and CBD, people will experience intense anxiety and paranoia. How do you predict who will experience intense anxiety and paranoia and who will experience intense relaxation, focus, and sense of creativity from ingesting or smoking a type one, type two, or type three sativa? There is no way to predict that. And there's a lot of kind of what I would call street lore or dorm room lore or kind of um, peer, not peer reviewed, peer discussed, I mean, among friends and people and acquaintances, lore out there that what one needs to do is simply smoke more, right? Or just ingest more. You hear that. Oh, well, listen, if it makes you paranoid, you simply need to use more. That is absolutely categorically false. Everything we know about the way that THC and CBD work is that they tend to potentiate, that is increase the effects of these different systems at given synapses and in different areas of the brain and body. That is, if someone experiences paranoia or anxiety from a given strain of the marijuana plant or from ingesting an edible in a particular way or a particular kind of edible, that person is very likely to experience the same effect every time they ingest that strain or variety. This is part of what's led to this enormous industry. I mean, there are a number of different reasons, but this is part of what's led to this enormous industry of highly customized cannabis, where people will spend some time really seeking out the different strains of cannabis and hybrids of cannabis that work best for them and work best for them in particular contexts. I wish I could tell you 
that if you are a person who is, you know, between five foot seven and uh, six feet tall and uh, you have blue eyes uh, or brown eyes, that the sativa varieties are going to be right for you or that the sativa varieties are going to give you panic attacks. I can't do that. The only way to determine it would be to actually experience ingesting those or smoking those, which is certainly also not what I'm suggesting, right? That's up to you. I'm not telling you what to do or what not to do, but there are no good predictors. In fact, if you look in the literature, it is not at all clear that people who have a heightened level of anxiety when they do not smoke cannabis will experience cannabis as less paranoia inducing or more relaxing. That's simply not the case. What we can say for sure is that general categories of effects such as increased focus and reduced anxiety are largely due to activation of areas like the prefrontal cortex. Now, unlike other compounds like nicotine or alcohol, or neurotransmitter systems like dopamine. When we talk about the cannabinoid system, and I say effects, biological effects, psychoactive effects, I want you to keep in mind always, please, please, please keep in mind that those effects can be varied and often opposite in direction. So let's just give an example of that. I just mentioned that when people smoke or, or eat sativa, that it tends to lead to one specific set of, or generally leads to one specific set of effects heightened focus, mood, et cetera. Whereas when they ingest or smoke indica and its components, right? Again, we're still talking about THC and CBD in varying ratios, but now indica cannabis and you say, well, why would it improve the transition time to sleep? Or at least give people the impression that it improved the transition time to sleep. We'll talk about what indica actually does for sleep in a little bit, but indica also tends to suppress activation of the amygdala and threat detection centers in the brain. Again, binding the same CB1 receptors and those retrograde signaling mechanisms that I talked about before, but it also tends to shut down the hippocampus, an area of the brain associated with memory, which is why indica varieties lead to pronounced, or I should say profound defects in short-term memory and sometimes in long-term memory as well, if it's consumed over long periods of time. We'll talk about short, medium, and long-term consumption, occasional consumption going forward. So what I'd like you to take away from this component of the discussion is, first of all, the mechanism of action by which cannabis impacts the brain and body, but in particular, the brain is going to be through CB1 receptors. And those CB1 receptors can lead to either an acceleration or a break on particular biological mechanisms. And there are going to be a constellation of different accelerations and breaking of different neural systems in the brain and body, depending on whether or not people ingest sativa or indica or some hybrid strain. And perhaps most importantly, even if you didn't understand anything that I've said about the biology of these different strains and the receptors, please do understand that there is no way to predict what the effect of a given strain will be on an individual. 